Barcelona, who of you has already joined one of the previous ones? Okay, so the rest of you is pretty new, which is amazing, and tonight is actually a very special moment for me, because like New Year, the first masterclass in 2020, and this time we have prepared a lot of amazing, really top-notch content for you, okay? Uh, just worked the entire last four nights and preparing 242 slides, so I hope you're motivated, 242 slides. But no worries, you're not going to be bored uh, just by my voice for two and a half hours. Uh, we're going to have some amazing guest speakers here tonight. So we have Andrea, our creative content director. Woo! We have Hugo, the absolute expert in e-commerce in Spain. And we have the amazing Tomas. He's the absolute expert in Europe when it comes to Amazon. So thank you so much for being here. And most likely, there's also gonna come Juan, uh, but he's still in a job interview, so maybe it's gonna, it's gonna run a little bit late. <clears throat> the way that we have designed tonight's masterclass is truly not a monologue, so you're just <laughs> listening to us and that's it, but it's more supposed to be like a dialogue where you can really take out some valuable content for you. So I really appreciate it that you come here on a Tuesday afternoon, spend your valuable time with us, and I really want you to take out value from that, okay? And just because of the fact that we're many presenters tonight, and I think all of you want to be more or less at home, like 9, 9.30ish, the latest, or 10 at the latest, uh, let's try to structure it tonight uh, in the way that we're gonna do like content, and then after each content chunk, we're gonna do a Q&A session, okay? And it's gonna be like five or six content parts, and afterwards always a Q&A session. It's just the only way to keep pace a little bit, if not, we're gonna get home by 11 or 12. Maybe we should lower the sound a little bit. <laughs> Valerie! Stacy! Valerie and stuff. I don't know she is. Can you, can you tell her? Thank you so much. <laughs> so, as I said, it's not a monologue, it's a dialogue. And I want you to be active and I want you to be to be like Valerie, like super, super loud. <laughs> and so the first thing I want to ask you guys, who of you actually uses Facebook or Instagram as a private person? Not for business purposes, but just in a private life. Who of you uses Facebook or Instagram? And who of you uses Facebook more than Instagram? And who of you uses Instagram more than Facebook? And when you're in Instagram, who of you... Yay, so it's not the music that's off, it's the mic that's off. <laughs> Amazing! <laughs> Doesn't matter. Uh, so when you're in Instagram, who of you spends more time in Instagram stories than in Instagram feeds? So who of you actually spends more time in stories? Okay, so amazing, the mic still does not work. Um, test, test. Okay, so the first, the first general insight that I wanted to share with you is that of, there's of course a little demographic mix. So sorry for the guys in the back, but the older the target group, the more they tend to be on Facebook. The younger they are, the more they tend to be on Instagram. And the younger they are within Instagram, the more they tend to be on stories, okay? So, yay, it works again. So that's like the first thing I wanted to share with you. And now let's talk about uh, the commercial part of it. Who of you has already run uh, some Facebook, Instagram ads in the past? Like in the six? Okay, and out of you guys, who of you spends currently more than 1,000 euros per month? More than 10,000 euros. 
more than 100,000 euros. More than a million? My God, I hear it. Okay, and the cool thing for tonight is that independently, if you have ever created Facebook Instagram ads in the past, or if you're completely new to the world of Facebook Instagram ads, the content from tonight is gonna be very valuable for you, okay? So we're gonna, I'm gonna start very slow with like setting the foundations. I'm gonna tell you really the basic buttons that you have to press to make sure that you're gonna set up the first campaigns in a successful way. So I really, I'm not these kind of experts to tell you you need to invest at least 5,000 euros, and after you spend 5,000 euros you can be profitable, that's bullshit. It's not true if you have other traffic sources, if you have a proper offer, you can't be profitable from the first euro that you spend on. You can't, but you have to apply some proper strategies on that. And tonight we're gonna to show you how to set up your first campaigns in a profitable way, and then how to really scale these, uh, these things. And I hope you're gonna like it as much as I do. So, my personal goal for tonight is to provide you with everything you need in order to create your own Facebook Instagram ads in a profitable way. And I'm gonna do that in a way to identify potential mistakes in campaigns that you've probably already set up, or to show you how to uh, avoid these mistakes from the first moment on. The strategies that I'm going to show you tonight are the exact strategies that I've already applied since 2012 uh, to over 120 different brands like A6, Power MBA, Mi Cuento, Viento, Clovo, Griteo, La Luz, Pere Paula, and also agencies like Alas Media or Gilby. And well, so we're just doing presentations there. And it helped them to generate over 10 million euros in return on ad spend for them so far. So what does ROAS exactly mean? So return on ad spend, well, what, what, what is ROAS? Who would, Daniel, what is ROAS? It means, uh, it means the factor you double your, or you, Vector, your, the vector of your ad spend to your earnings. Exactly. So imagine that you spend, in this case, like 2 million euros, you make 5 million euros in return. It's like your return on ad spend of 2.3, okay? Let's imagine you spend 1 euro and you make 5 euros in return. What's the ROAS? Exactly, 5. And our goal with Facebook and Instagram is always to have a ROAS as high as possible, okay? And a ROAS that's below 1 is not good. So you spend one euro, you make like 50 cent or 70 cent or something in return, that's not good, okay? Uh, just to make that clear. And all of these strategies help me to also be included in the Forbes 30 and the 30 list uh, in Europe and also in the German speaking countries. And all of this would have never been possible without an amazing team uh, behind me. So, muchas gracias a todos. Y gracias, Loretta. Yeah. <laughs> and all of these tips and tricks are also included in our baby, our product, <laughs> Uh, our service, uh, which is the Ads Accelerator program. It's a six-week online course uh, with all these amazing content and includes tools and checklists and it has a support group in Facebook and WhatsApp and it really helped uh, many people already, especially this guy here. You remember your face? <laughs> and I'm gonna present you a little bit uh, more details about that in like an hour, but uh, I'm not gonna do it too long, okay? Because tonight it's more about content, okay? Uh, I'm gonna start off with teaching you the full funnel strategy and how to apply it to your own campaigns. So who of you has ever heard about the full funnel strategy? Andrea, come on. Okay, and who would like to explain it properly in like one, in like one sentence? Who is brave enough? Mm -hmm. Venga, te toca. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, the full funnel strategy is pretty much the entire um, journey that a customer takes, beginning from being a very cold customer, they don't even know, they're not aware of you, and then gradually they go through each phase, which in each phase you have to, um, you have to warm them up, you have to show them different content, and so finally it's a transaction and they're finally a client, and then, you know, keeping them as a loyal customer. Yay. But one has to say that she has competitive advantage because she's from Miami, so her English is <laughs> it's very easy for her. So, uh, that's what I'm going to focus on now, over the next like 40 minutes, 35, 40 minutes, like how to take this knowledge that Andrea just said, to really communicate different messages to different customers, and how to apply this to your own Facebook Instagram. Mm -hmm. That's the first content chunk that I'm gonna present. Then I'm gonna hand over to Andrea, and she's, as you can probably see, he, she, this tonight, she does, she didn't bring all of her camera equipment and stuff, but typically she comes here with like 10 different cameras, 100 lights and stuff. And she's our in-house expert for uh, creative content production. 
Okay, so she's our content director in Ads Accelerator, and she knows honestly a lot. She's the person that I know that knows the most about uh, how to create killer Facebook Instagram ad videos. Okay, and as you probably know, the content that you upload to these platforms becomes more and more important. So it's not anymore about like really like the buttons and the settings that you press and stuff, but it's really about having valuable content, not only on, not only on the organic platform, but also on the paid part. Okay, so the better the videos, the better, you, the higher your ROAS is going to be. And she's gonna teach you how many tricks? Six? Yes, six. Six amazing tricks. Uh, I watched all of them last night when I included your slides, and I truly believe that it's this very good content. And after Andrea's part, we're gonna do a five minute Q&A, okay, so you can also ask her directly. And if you wanna stay longer, so the content should end around uh, 8.30, so from now in like two hours, okay? And then we're gonna still, we're still gonna be here, like the entire team, uh, for some networking. You can also connect with all the others. And you're happily invited, but if you need to go home, that's also fine. I would say that at around 8.30, we're gonna be done with the content, and another one hour of networking. See, also when else? Perfecto? Thank you. Okay, after Andrea is going to share with us her insights on the creative part, Hugo, uh, which is, an, uh, use, as, I, as I already told you, he's the number one expert when it comes to e-commerce here in Spain, and he's such an expert that he launched his own e-commerce antelope, and how did it go? <laughs> You'll see. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, he's, a, he's, a, he's an amazing guy, and he has an interesting story about his own e-commerce. And after that, I'm gonna pitch a little bit about Ed's Accelerator program, but not too much. And then uh, if Juan is gonna come, if not, I'm gonna do this part from him. It's about lead generation. So who of you has ever generated leads online? Either for Facebook or by other platforms? Okay, and we have three uh, top tricks to generate leads in a scalable way with Facebook Instagram ads. And we're gonna share it after uh, the part from Google. And then we're gonna finish tonight's presentation with Amazon tips and tricks from Tomas. Who of you has ever worked with Amazon? Nice. And who of you thinks that probably in the future Amazon could be an interesting platform for him or her? Yep. Very good. So you have your right audience here, Thomas. Now, ready to get started? Yes. Yes? yes? See? Bueno, poco más de motivación, chicos. Si o no? Venga, eso sí. Perfecto. How to apply the full funnel strategy to your own campaigns. From a macro level, we can say that we're experiencing one of the most perfect transformations in the history of the world. Which kind of transformation could this be? The digital transformation, amazing. The digital transformation, when it comes to Facebook and Instagram, it basically means in this room, I mean, of course, it's a very selective group because you come to Facebook and Instagram's masterclass, but everyone raised the hand of like using the platform actively and stuff. In general, from like uh, 7 billion people that live on this planet, 2.4 billion are monthly active users, 1.6 billion are daily active users from Facebook. So you can say that one out of four human beings on this entire planet uses Facebook at least once per month. And Instagram is 1.1 billion monthly and 0.6 billion, so 600 million daily active users. So you could say more or less one out of 10 human beings uses Instagram, okay? And the cool thing for us that is that both platforms are included in the Facebook Business Manager, okay? So the Facebook Business Manager is where you administrate your ads, so los anuncios, and right now there's a hot topic, a trending topic uh, that's going on with WhatsApp. So who of you right now thinks that Facebook is going to launch ads in WhatsApp in the next month? Who of you thinks uh, WhatsApp is always gonna be without ads? And who of you has no clue? <laughs> and I have no clue, to be honest, because there are so many rumors going on, and I did so many interviews saying like, yeah, they're gonna launch WhatsApp ads in, in WhatsApp status, but now they once again refused. So they said, no, it's gonna be free forever but then you know, they, they switch their own opinions every three months. So for now, in this specific moment, it seems that WhatsApp is gonna be free of ads, but there's one thing that you can do with WhatsApp already. Who knows what you can do with, with Facebook, Instagram ads? What can you do with WhatsApp already? Groups. You can do groups, exactly. What, what else can you do? You can link it directly to uh, WhatsApp. You can link it directly to WhatsApp from the Messenger. Exactly. So. One thing, so, so one thing is you're in Facebook, you're in Instagram, you see an ad there, okay, so feed or in stories, and you click on the ad, 
the typical thing that happens is that they bring you to an external page, right? So to your website, you can you have a lead magnet or whatever. That's a typical thing. But what you can do is what Daniel just said. You can also uh, the person could also click on the app, and instead of bringing him or her to an external page, it will open up a conversation in Facebook Messenger. Okay, so we will open up like a little chat already from your page, and it says like, hey, thank you so much for clicking on the ad. Uh, it seems that you're interested, then you can, have a, you, connect, you can connect easily with a chatbot, okay? So that the chatbot responds to automatically several things. And this used to be only possible with Facebook Messenger, but that's what they already implemented with WhatsApp, okay? So that's what you can already do. So no, you cannot really have your ad showing up on WhatsApp, but what you can do is you can link the destination URL instead of to an external website, you can link that to WhatsApp. And not only WhatsApp business, so I'm not using WhatsApp business, I'm using WhatsApp like normally, and I'm running some ads, and bringing, this, bringing the traffic in Facebook and Instagram, and you click on it, it brings them directly to my, to my WhatsApp page, uh, WhatsApp, to, my, uh, to my WhatsApp chat. Anyone of you has done that already, with WhatsApp? Uh, anyone has done that with WhatsApp? Already, you, you did it, and how, how did it go? Uh, you receive uh, a lot of requests, I mean, people engage, are more likely to engage, I think. And it's super easy to set up. You just need to go to your Facebook page, okay? So you are not your personal profile, but to your Facebook page. And there in settings, you just connect the WhatsApp number. And what you just said, you will you will receive a request, okay? And then just confirm that. And then from that moment on, you can bring all the traffic you want to your WhatsApp chat, which is, well, it's an interesting feature that's already uh, possible in this moment. And why does all of this matter? Well, because there's a lot of WhatsApp users on this planet and we can communicate not only in a monologue, but a dialogue with them, and that's pretty cool. And so the last two times I was at the Facebook headquarters in Dublin, I always asked them, so what is the future like of Facebook ads? What is the next step? What is going on? Because it's like super important for their own life, right? And they typically answer like the future is here in something what they call conversational marketing. So it's not a monologue anymore. You do not spam users in their feeds, in the stories, but you rather engage in a dialogue with them. So you bring them to a Facebook Messenger chat, you bring them to a WhatsApp conversation, then you have a chat bot if you want, you can have manual, you can have a support team and stuff. But that's what they say, where they see the future in this area when it comes to conversational marketing. So we said one out of four human beings in in the entire world uses Facebook, one out of 10 uses Instagram, but what about Spain, right? So what do you think? What's the percentage of Facebook, Instagram, its users from all the Spanish population? So we have 47 million inhabitants in Spain. What do you think? What's the, how many, how many out of these 47 million, how many people use Facebook, Instagram here in Spain? 50 million. 50 million? No, almost, but 30, 30 million would be quite a lot. A little bit less, what do you think? 20. 20? So we have 30, we have 20, what do you think? 25. 25, so... Pretty good guesses, actually. So where do I take the number from? Because in my life, uh, I do not trust... So in German you say, uh, don't trust the statistic that you didn't falsify on yourself, <laughs> that you didn't fake on your own, okay? And so where do I take these numbers from? It's literally like going inside the Ads Manager, creating an audience, selecting entire Spain, uh, 18 to 65, both genders, and then just take a look at the potential reach that the actual numbers give you, okay? So it's not just some random whatever, I just search, search it in Google or stuff. It's like the actual, uh, um, the actual potential reach that this machine gives you. So like 67% of the Spanish population is, uh, is seen as monthly active users of Facebook and Instagram. And why is it not 100%? Why is, it, why is it only 62? Yeah, it's really the kind of children, the yeah, old people, you have people that simply do not like to use social media, right? Um, but it's still a, a rather high number if you take away like all the young, like very young people, all the old people, so it's a very, very high market penetration. In the United States, one out of three, um, well, let's say young, younger generations, so they're below 30 years old, okay? Uh, I'm turning 30 in three years, so I still, I, I'm turning 30 in three days, so this Friday, so I can still see myself as being part of the young generation, 
and people below 30, one third of them in the United States, the first thing that they do in the morning is check social media before they brush their teeth, before they go to the bathroom, before they do whatever. So who of you does it? Yeah. Now, be honest. <laughs> But it's all, it's almost like but you're but you're you you're you're American. Exactly, I'm part of that statistic. <laughs> so we see that around sixty-seven percent of the Spanish inhabitants uses Facebook and Instagram at least once per month. And here's also a little uh, demographic uh, distribution in the Spanish population. So you see that a little bit more women use these platforms than men, and the biggest age group is between twenty-five and fifty-four, more or less. And if you want to target these specific audiences, okay, for example, women, let's say only women or only men or women in one specific age group, it's super, super easy. That's why I told you, like the buttons that you have to press, that become more and more simple, actually. What really matters at the end of the day is to have amazing video content. And video is better than image, okay? So that's what really matters if you want to high row us. If you want to have high row us, you have to have amazing ads. Okay? And you want to reach the right people and stuff, but it becomes easier and easier. I mean, for example, if I want to target only women, like you remember, like out of these 29 million, <laughs> around 50, 54% are women. So I just take Spain, select women, mujeres, y ya está. It's literally like two buttons. If I want to select men, it's the same. And if I want to select, for example, women between 35 and 54, that's what you get is the potential reach. So it's very, very easy. You just press these buttons and you're good. And as I said, in tonight's presentation, it's setting the foundations for the, for the remaining parts. So being like, uh, well, setting the foundations in the beginning, but there are also some expert tips. So for the ones who are already, already a little bit more advanced, I don't know if you already knew this little trick, maybe not all of you, but if you want to laser sharply target, for example, everyone in this room, you easily can do that. If I want to make my, so who of you has seen an ad from me in the past? <laughs> and if I want to target now all the other people that have never seen an ad from me, it's super easy. It's super, super easy. I could li literally like take people in this room, exclude the ones that have already seen an ad, and only focus on these people. And how can you focus on one specific room? Well, for example, if you, uh, it's called drag a pin, if you drop a pin in Espanol Fijaro Marcador, and imagine that you're doing this in Malaga, okay? and you want to focus on one specific location there, what's the problem? The radius, because the minimum radius is one kilometer. I mean, I already brought it down from the minimum, which was 17 kilometers. If you just put in Barcelona, for example, the, the minimum radius that they can let you really choose is between 17 and 40 kilometers. But it's not laser sharp, like a radius of 17 kilometers to really narrow it down to like one kilometer you can either put in the address, but their mapping is not super, super complete, okay? So if you put in like whatever, Plaza de Catedral Número 3, it's muy probable que no sale, honestamente. Es que there are so, not a lot of uh, addresses that are really included in their mapping. You, you can put in like Avenida Diagonal, okay, <laughs> you know, but still, okay? So it's much better to, to drop a pin, fijar un marcador, you just zoom in, you put in the pin wherever you want, let's say imagine directly here, but it's still like one kilometer of radius. How can I narrow it down further? How can I make sure to only focus on people in this room and not people in like, uh, whatever, in Urkinaona? Exclude the other uh, from outside. Exactly, anyone else also know it? Exclude mm. with things around exactly. the area. Yeah. Exactly, oh. so you basically uh, track, so you drop these pins like the neighborhoods that do not matter to you and you can you can easily play around with that for whatever for hours and make sure that you really focus only on this specific area here then you want to make sure that you do not apply additional filters like whatever like if i select only hombres i would not be able to uh, to impact andrea obviously right so all of these other filters are then applied as well so i would just in your case if you want to focus on people in this room it's easy, you just um, let it rather open, you select a different age if you want, both genders, and then you can work with these uh, tags. Yes? All yes. clear? Any questions to that? No. All good. See? Okay, on top of that, it's like this demographic and uh, geographic uh, targeting, there's of course also 
uh, detailed segmentation. So that's like the standard targeting that everyone knows when you start with Facebook and Instagram. It's like the first kind of targeting that you typically choose. You can either choose between advanced uh, demographic data, interest-based, or behavior. Okay, these are like the three categories. And beside, and within all of these categories, for example, in uh, demographic data, you have like education. You have if they have children. You have if they are in a relationship. If they have a new job or not. Uh, you can filter different interests and behaviors. And when it comes to interests, let's imagine that we are running ads for a restaurant. Okay? Anyone of you knows Czechonish? Like it's my favorite restaurant here in Barcelona. And let's imagine we're running ads for it's an Italian place. Okay, down here with uh, Rambla Colonna. So whatever. And that's my favorite restaurant, and I just thought, what if I would run Facebook ads for them and just to make it a little bit more tangible? You know, like what would I do for them actually? So I would choose specific audiences, and I would, for example, choose the interest uh, comida y bebida, like like food and drinks. And I would take, for example, people who are interested in cuisine italiana. Okay, so in the entire world, that's why they give you this number here. In, in the entire world, there are 134 million monthly active users out of the 2.4 billion. 134 million are interested in uh, Italian cuisine. Um, but here, of course, you would only be interested in people in Barcelona to promote the restaurant, and you could select, for example, this one here. Maybe let's imagine we're running ads for La Vietnamita, so we could also do it here, or for pizza, vegetariano, lo que queramos. And all of this is super cool, because we have an amazing opportunity for our business here, because we can really reach more than 67% of the Spanish population, and theoretically we could do that with our organic posts on Facebook and Instagram, which are for free, right? So theoretically, we could just post a lot of things. I also encourage you to promote our events on your own Instagram profile and stuff and tag us. So theoretically, it's for free. Can I just ask, in your ads, when you were targeting normal guests, did you have for a broad audience, or did you use the school details? Where, where, where are you from exactly? Do you live in Barcelona? Who of you lives in Barcelona? Yeah. Who of you uh, is from abroad? Who's not from Spain? Who, hey, you came all the way from Bratislava, right? Yeah. Okay. Nice. Thanks so much. Thanks so much for flying here. I really appreciate it. Like, I really, really appreciate it. Um, so, on the one hand, in order to impact this wonderful gentleman over there, but on the other hand, also focusing on the local audience, it's a stretch, right? But then we apply like the 80-20 rule, so the majority in this room is from Barcelona. So to promote this event, I did two things. First, I focused on the local market, people in Barcelona, but in addition, I did retargeting for people who bought our online course, and they're only in the online course, they saw an upsell, and hey, don't you wanna fly to Barcelona and stuff? Have an amazing Facebook Instagram masterclass. So that's what I did. So that's already a little bit more advanced. In the beginning, what I always did, so it's like the 20th masterclass already. The first ones, I always choose people interested in uh, social media marketing, people interested in digital marketing, small and medium-sized entrepreneurs, e-commerce, all of them that tested these different audiences. But now, after running 20 of them, doing it for what, tw two years already, uh, our pixel has gathered a lot of data. So right now, in this moment, it works better for us if we have it completely broad and just let the algorithm optimize for us. But this doesn't work in the first moment. And as we have seen, like many people have not run campaigns so far. So that's why I didn't mention it in the beginning because if you run your first campaigns, the Facebook algorithm is very good, but it's also not magic, right? So if you don't have data, if you don't have historical data, you also can't do anything. But once you've gathered a lot of uh, data, it's very good. One of the high, highest ROAS campaigns that we have run on Black Friday, and on the Black Friday, we, with, with one e-commerce brand that I work together, we spend over half a million euro in one day, okay, returning two million in one day. And one of the highest ROAS campaigns was worldwide targeting and leave it completely open. It's like 2.4 billion people. So it's like the complete opposite of narrow audience. Yeah. Outside of what you think. So 
choose red. And now when I do it, I see that the broad audience only gets on the traffic. And as a convergent, when I click the detail targeting, and it makes more sense to me, so that the things that I know before, to make the target just like, no, don't they focus on the things that you Yes. So I agree. If you have gathered quite, if you have gathered some data at least in the past, the broader the audiences, the better they typically work now. Because the algorithm has become much smarter, it works very well and stuff. If you're just starting from scratch, it's it, it, like it's impossible. Like how could they do it? And even so in the US, people tend to call this broad targeting. In the US they tend to call it uh, zero targeting. Because you do not select anything, which is nonsense. Okay, it's, it's simply not right that it's like zero targeting. It's broad targeting, applying all the historical data that your account has already gathered in the past and making these decisions for you. So imagine that in the past, out of the last 20, 19 masterclasses, 80% were women. Let's imagine that. I would actually need prefer. <laughs> Let's imagine that's the case, okay? 80% women, but then the pixel has gathered a lot of data. What do you think? from now on, would they rather target women or men? Mm. Like women, okay? But if they have not gathered data in the past, it's impossible for them, okay? So in the beginning, I would recommend to define your buyer persona on your own. Go narrow in the beginning, and the beginning for me means like the first more or less 1,000 euros that you spend on an account, okay? The first 1,000 euros, more or less, that you spend on an account, I would rather target the narrowly, and once you spend more, especially if you have already spent more than 10,000 euros in an account, I'd rather go broad. If you have spent millions, like really very broad works much better. Well, what about you? What about your uh, experience? Broad, narrow? Yeah, because I'm so lucky I this not so big population that here. In Spain, Spain is too much. We are only the country 5.5 million people. But also we start because I'm here, because uh, last year I visited uh, Malaga four times, and also we have a new customer from Spain. So that, that's the same like you spoke now. Right. I agree with you. Very good. Oh, I appreciate it if you agree. Thank you so much. <laughs> so, um, my point was we could theoretically just run a couple of organic posts because they're for free, and that's it. And we're gonna make a lot of money. So, you know, without investing one single euro and stuff. Yes, but the problem is, this is not gonna work nowadays. This used to work like in the past, if you did a lot of posts, you increased your fan base in your photos. I mean, it's not tremendous, but together, it's still like almost 29,000 uh, people of potential reach. If you would assume that no Instagram follower is a Facebook fan and stuff, which is also not the case because there's a, an overlaps, <laughs> but let's assume that there are like 29,000 people that we could reach. But the problem is this one. Who of you has faced this problem, that organic reach is lower and lower? Who of you has encountered that? And what does it mean? What does it mean that organic web reach is low? That we have to buy it, that's reach. Uh, that we have to buy the switch now. Exactly. So imagine, and okay, I will show you this. So out of my 29,000 uh, com people community, if my organic reach is only 7%, like my true reach, the people that I'm really going to uh, impact with my organic posts is a maximum of like 2,000 people. And these 2,000 people have already auto-selected themselves in the past, they've already started following and stuff. So it's not the best way nowadays to really make an amazing business model out of it. I mean, of course, if you're an influencer, and if this number here, uh, you add some zeros, right, then it's still, it's, it's, it still makes sense, right? But if your organic reach is lower and lower, because Facebook wants to monetize on you, they think exactly what you just said, so then, well, then you pay for the, for the reach, then of course, um, you either have a face like this gentleman here, and still rely on organic posts, or, you rather find some solutions, and the best solution I've seen so far is running ads. Uh, so what did Mark Zuckerberg say when when the senators in the United States uh, asked him, but, well then how do you make money? What did he say? No? Who, who knows it? Senator, we run ads. 
okay? Yeah. So that's like the famous quote. I even bought a hoodie that says Santa that we run ads. Next time I'm gonna put it on, it's fine. So with Facebook ads, uh, you can increase this organic reach and you're not only limited anymore to like the 28,900 top of like the people that already follow you, but you can really reach basically everyone on this planet that uses this platform at least once per month. The only problem is that it's also a rather complete tool, just like 10 different campaign objectives, and it's not so trivial to spend 100 euros, 500 euros, 1,000 euros to make proper return on that. It's also not that easy to us. It's not like uh, something that every child could do and would expect a lot of returns. Why? Well, because it has, it, it has so many options. So you really want to make sure if you run an, a reach campaign, that you run, when you run a traffic campaign, when you run a conversion campaign, when you run a uh, lead generation campaign. And the strategy that I would like to present you tonight is the full funnel strategy, which takes into consideration four different levels in the customer journey. So branding, prospecting, retargeting, and upsell. And on each of these different levels, it communicates different messages with different campaign objectives. Okay, and I would like to share this with you tonight because I think it's, it's really practical because you're gonna leave uh, after tonight's session knowing exactly which kind of campaign type you should create on each of these fun layers. Parece bien, si o no? Si o no? Si o no? Venga. So the full funnel strategy is not something that I made up on my own. Uh, it's something that I have learned in the headquarters in Dublin. It's also based on the Facebook buying and planning professional certificate. And it really helped many, many companies to lower their cost. And once they were profitable, they were able to put more money into the machine and increase their sales. And here, for example, we have uh, well, Marta from 21 Buttons, Oscar from Viento, or La Luz, Pitchbox that say, the full funnel strategy of Patrick helped us to lower our cost and increase our sales. And that's also what I teach, not only these kind of masterclasses, but also several universities. So I started with the smaller ones, and now I teach a lot of this also at the ESSE, at the Saale, at La Salle, and also at my own university in Vienna, where I used to study for like six years. And we're doing these masterclasses, and it's actually also one co-work uh, space in, well, in Plaza Catalunya, and it's the Decimal headquarters, and also the Founder Summit in Germany from the 5,000 people. And, um, in one week, next Tuesday, I'm gonna be almost in front of the same audience again in Malaga. <coughs> We're in Malaga at the uh, Gaspro Marketing Conference, it's like 1,300 people. And I'm gonna show how to make amazing ads for restaurants. How many ads did I run for restaurants in my life? Zero. <laughs> but yeah, so that's why I had to think about how we could actually do that. Okay, so what is this full funnel strategy? It basically means exactly what Andrea told us, that you communicate different messages to different customers according to the current level in the customer journey. So commuting, communicating different messages to a person that bought our online program, who lives in Slovakia, or to someone who is from Barcelona and just falls into the category of social media interest, that's obvious, right? That you want to communicate different messages, but also uh, it becomes a little more, bit more tricky when you want to do this according to the current level in the customer journey. Why? Well, because a customer journey is not something mega trivial. A customer journey can be split into awareness, consideration, acquisition, service, loyalty. could also be like this. Um, here, for example, see a customer journey <coughs> from India. And it can even be as complicated as that one. So it's not that easy anymore if you really want to communicate a specific message to each of these specific customers <laughs> on each level of the customer journey. And the good thing, very much aligned to what you said about the broader audience and stuff. It's not the recipe to success anymore if you hyper segment into the last element, everything, okay? So back in the past, uh, when I started doing ads in 2012, 2013, 2014, I typically reached the maximum level of ad sets that you could have in one ad account. Why? Well, because we super segmented, like mega segmented. Like every single person received a specific ad, and this person here received a specific ad on Facebook mobile newsfeed, on Facebook desktop newsfeed, on Facebook desktop right color, on Instagram stories, and on Instagram feed. So every single person in a specific language, in a specific uh, placement. 
Well, nowadays that's not necessary anymore because you have multi-language ads. So you can set up one ad. If the person is in Slovakia, he's gonna receive the ad in Slovakian. If I've set it up in Slovakian or at least in English, if I set it up in English. If the person is in Spain, he's gonna see the ad in Spanish. You just have to define it up front. But you can set up these multi-language ads that helps you already. Um, on, very importantly, as we heard, like broader audiences stuff, it doesn't work that properly anymore. If you segment everything that much, it's much more recommendable to consolidate data points at least into three or four different layers. So we have the branding layer, the prospecting layer, the retargeting, and which is the fourth one that is missing? <coughs> Very good. So it's always going to be more profitable for you to encourage an already existing customer from Slovakia to buy an entrance for this masterclass who already knows you, already has some trust, already, you know, forms part of the community, then some of us never ever heard of you, has no idea who this guy is, says he's a little bit the humus, ya está, no? It's much more difficult, here on top of that, to really bring someone from the very top all the way down, and someone who has already convert, converted, and cross or upsell this person and reach the increase or enhance the life and value of this customer by increasing the loyalty. And what do you want to do on each of these? And I think it's also clear that at least, like really like at least, at least, you want to segment between like the upper two layers, which is like cold traffic, people who have not converted and do not really know you, and warm traffic. So that's like the first thing that I really want to take, that I really want you to take out from tonight. Please, Stop communicating the same message to everyone. It doesn't work anymore. It used to work, but now it doesn't work anymore. So at least to people who do not know you, commun communicate them something different than to people who have already come to your website or people that have even bought your product. And in an ideal world, you communicate proper campaigns on each of these layers. So let's make this practical. Imagine that once upon a time, there was an amazing restaurant in Barcelona and it's called Carl Patrick. Kiosemla, <laughs> or Carl Patrick. Okay, and which restaurant is it? Okay. So let's imagine that's our restaurant. And we want to apply the full funnel strategy now, like with these four layers, for some Facebook ads for this restaurant. So I guess we all agree that the objective for this restaurant is to acquire new customers and retain them, right? So if once they're a customer, that they keep coming, keep coming. <coughs> uh, bless you. So that's the, that's the most important goal from these restaurants. Keep people coming and coming uh, to, the, to the restaurant and also having new customers. How can we achieve that? Well, when we're on branding level, what we want to do is we want to start communicating emotion. Why does this matter? Well, from a neuromarketing point of view, our human brain can be separated into two halves, the left and the right half, and the left half being the rational part where we understand like numbers, like facts, all of these things. On the right side, we have more the emotional part where we understand like music, feelings, and in order to really put your restaurant, for example, Carl Patrick, in the consideration side of the user, in the long run, you want to apply uh, what well, you want to um, impact both sides. How can we do this now with the emotional part? So, very cool, like emotional part, two sides of the brain and stuff, but which is the perfect campaign for that? What do you think? Like we have 10 different campaigns, uh, what, do, what do you think, what's the perfect campaign? Reach, because, um, so in my opinion, because we want to uh, reach a lot of people with this emotional message. So reach, reach is an option. Alcance, Aleskerda. Who, what else? What do you think, guys? What's the perfect campaign plan? Mm -hmm. The low is perfect for the interaction because you can then uh, like simulate the, uh, the emotion and they interact with the ad. Yes, sounds very good. So, what is an interaction exactly? Well, well he, I think he's in considering any action the user made with the app. So, it could be on Facebook and you know, the like or the click or everything that stimulates the, the user to interact to touch the app. <laughs> Exactly, so basically like the like button, which is now called reactions and like the positive ones and the negative ones, comment, sharing, but also any, any interaction is also if they click on see more, so they open up this entire box, basically every interaction, as you just said. What else, what do you think, what's the perfect, which, what's the perfect, which kind of objective would you use if you run a branding ad? Primera, the first 
So out of these 10 campaign objectives, what do you think about the traffic objective? Does it make sense on branding level? Yes or no? Well, for me it does not, okay? So for me a traffic campaign on branding level is not the typical thing that I would do. All of the four options that you have mentioned, like the typical ones, like uh, brand awareness and reach, okay, makes complete sense. But I have not seen, so that's what typically Facebook would recommend, right? Like, no, they also put like a funnel, like uh, reconocimiento, consideración, comercial. They also put it like in these three columns. That's what Facebook would, would suggest to you. So uh, I agree with Alberto and Matias. So that, yes, reach and brand awareness makes sense. But from my tests, I did not see the very best results for that. And which kind of tests were they? Uh, one of them is, going, is, going, is a case study by Facebook, which is going to be published in March, most likely. So we spent 6,000 euros on uh, on each of these campaigns. Brand awareness, 6,000 on reach, 6,000 on interactions, and 6,000 in uh, video views. So reproduction of videos, so in total 24,000 euros. And we did a brand lift study. So we did uh, pure, well, uh, encuestas, surveys, surveys, we did surveys before, the 24K spent and service after the 24K spent. And really wanted to see which kind of these campaigns really has the highest impact on brands recall and brand recognition. And even though like the intuitive thing would be like, yeah, of course, we should this thing here, but people actually did not remember the ads so well in these two campaign types as they did, for example, with the interaction campaign or with the video view campaign. Why? Why do you think this happens? Why do you think like for branding, interaction, or video view campaigns did work better? Any idea? What do you think, guys? Interaction. Oh, but why? Why do you think uh, inter yeah. Because you can collect more data about, for instance, the percentage of video views or um, the interaction of customers in order to do, I mean, truths or uh, localize. Exactly. exactly, so you can easily collect a lot of conversion points and we also, I really liked also the idea with the video view campaign and that people watch the, watch the video and then you create an audience of people who have watched a specific video and you re-impact them on a later level, for example on prospecting or retargeting later, earlier. But in general it's just from my interpretation that just because people once they already actively interact in some kind of way, either they put in their finger to really do some likes or comments or whatever, or they watch the video until the end. And um, that's what really, really brought them into this mindset of remembering the brand. It's just an interesting result from a study that we did. And the placement that I recommend uh, to run branding ads is actually Instagram stories, okay? Instagram stories out of the five major placements is Currently, the cheapest one. Okay. So, which are the five? Which are the five major placements? La ubicación es donde se puede entregar el anuncio. Instagram feed, stories, Facebook mobile news feed, Facebook desktop news feed, Facebook stories, and desktop right now. Exactly. Exactly. Yesterday, for example, I uh, well, supervised and audited the campaign from La Casha Bank, which was just optimizing for video views and the fact to add like in-stream placements, like increase the percentage of people that stayed until at least 15 seconds. And there was like celebrating great results and stuff. Patrick, it's amazing. We added this placement. It's so cool. But it's exactly what you said. Like you oblige them. But it's like then it's not a non-skippable ad. So you have to watch these 15 seconds. So I don't know if it is such a good branding impact if you really like 
spam all of these people, they have to watch the video, they cannot skip it. So it increases the percentage of people that stay until the end, but at which cost, you know? And when, when I'm at the branding level, I personally prefer that people like or like communicate to them and not just apply chain them because it's a non-skippable ad. So Instagram stories, I like it a lot because it has very low CPMs. In general, you could even say, so what's the most expensive placement? Where is, where is it the most expensive to run your ads? Exactly, Facebook desktop newsfeed is the most expensive, and why? Okay. What do you think? 80% uh, of the Facebook users join Facebook on the phone. I must be woman and, and, uh, and, and mobile. Uh, four, four times more, four, 22, 20. Exactly. So once you are on the desktop device, it's more likely that you end up paying. And at the end, uh, Facebook makes you pay more for people that are going to be likely to actually end up buying. People who are just likely to view a video, or people who are just likely to put a like are cheap. But people who are actually likely to purchase are expensive. Why? Well, because it's a, it's a free market, supply and demand, there's a lot of demand for these people, and therefore the CPMs are going up. But Instagram Stories still maintains a very low CPM, and you can still reach all of these people with the right campaign type, but it's just uh, up to five times cheaper than, for example, targeting one of the same person on desktop newsfeed. So if I want to uh, spoil and spam Daniel from now on every single day with my ads, I could either do it on desktop newsfeed and pay five times more, or I could do it in Instagram stories. Knowing that my audience is rather millennials, he's gonna be there. And then on Instagram stories, it's also a highly visual element, a uh, highly visual placement, especially when it comes to branding, you want to make sure that you communicate emotions, okay? And you cannot really do it with just uh, one banner. You want to do it with a video or an Instagram story, it's pretty, it's uh, the adequate one for that. So that's what I would recommend on branding level. Then let's go one level lower. Once people have already heard about us, they know about this amazing Cal Patrick, this restaurant uh, in the south of Barcelona. And now it comes to converting them. Now it comes to convincing them to really reserve a table there, to show up, to order online, whatever. But now let's make some money. And this is now not the left, the right side anymore, but rather the left side of the brain. And what we want to do is a different kind of campaign type now. What do you think about the traffic objective for that? Good? Not so good? Would you, would you use traffic? Yeah. Um, yes, I think so. That's what many people do. Actually, one of the well, one of the campaign types which is most used is the traffic campaign objective, and it makes sense somehow, right? Because what you do is you bring people to your website, and then you could sign up and stuff. But there is a big problem. On the one hand, there is a lot of demand for traffic campaigns, so the price is high; they're rather expensive. But on the other hand, there's something interesting for you guys. Uh, a, a statistic that I've learned in the last Facebook performance summit in Madrid, last September, directly from the Facebook attribution responsible, who said that within Facebook Instagram, 6% of all Facebook Instagram users account for 85% of all clicks. Okay, so let's imagine this room here, these six people account for basically 85% of all clicks. Okay, so it's a very narrow range. So if you, if you run a traffic campaign, of course, it will not optimize for Tomas, Hugo, Andrea. It will optimize for these six people, which is good, right? But then the second fact, these six people are negatively correlated with the probability to purchase. Because they're just people who click on everything. Okay? I mean, sorry, maybe you're not <laughs> clicking on everything, but they're just... There's just a certain amount of internet users who tend to click on everything, which are targeted by a traffic campaign, which is already expensive because everyone runs traffic campaigns. On the other hand, these 6% of the internet users are negatively correlated with the probability to purchase. So they're never ever gonna buy up, end up buying. Here are the people, maybe you're, maybe this guy's gonna buy, maybe this girl is gonna buy, but I'm not reaching you with my traffic campaign. With my traffic campaign, I'm gonna focus on these six. Uh, wonderful people here, which is good, but not recommendable. Okay, don't do it. It's it's actually not uh, optimized. I rather recommend 
So what I typically run for many, many things is I typically run conversion campaigns. Okay, that's what I typically do. Also just from a general technical point of view, all of these campaigns technically are conversion campaigns. But a conversion is defined as something different. It, like the algorithm of Facebook just collects ones and zeros. It's also not magic, it just collects ones and zeros. Let's do Q&A afterwards, okay? Because we are already running six minutes late. And Andrea is already waiting for amazing content, okay? So actually it just collects ones and zeros. And if you run a conversion campaign optimized for purchase, a purchase is a one, non-purchase is zero. And the more ones, the better, okay? When we optimize a campaign, for example, on traffic, it's also a conversion campaign, but a conversion is a link click. Okay, so everyone who clicks on yet is like a one. Everyone who does not, does not click on yet is a zero. And Facebook tries to find people who do ones, who do ones, who do ones, then it focuses on this area of the audience, okay? And that's not so good. If you're running the ads for the restaurant, and our objective is to really get people to reserve on the phone or whatever, and we could also run lead generation ads. Who of you, well, who of you did already run lead generation ads? And what are lead generation ads? Very quickly. Um, lead generation ads are an ad to yes. <laughs> But how does it look like? If, if someone clicks on the ad, what happens? It's, it's an instant experience. Exactly. So the um, people can do the um, show name or first name directly in Facebook or not on a different page. Exactly, that's what happens. So an instant experience, which is basically <coughs> used to be called Canvas, okay? And it's basically just a pop-up. So if you're in Facebook, you're in Instagram, you click on the ad, instead of bringing you to an external URL, it just opens up a pop-up, okay? And in this pop-up, you can fill in your email address, your name, your telephone number and stuff. And if you're a restaurant and we want to make reservations, maybe this is one kind of campaign that I would run for them. Maybe I would also run a, a messenger campaign for them, where I have a chatbot behind it. What's the easiest platform to set up a chatbot in less than 20 minutes? Exactly, so if you, uh, and I'm getting 50% of commission for everyone who signs up for ManyChat, I do not, obviously. So what if you want to do, uh, just go to manychat.com, okay? There you can, like many, or como muchos, manychat, manychat.com, and it's super easy, it's, it's a good free version, so you don't even have to pay. Sí, hay una versión gratis y uno de pago que son como 10 euros al mes. Wow. Es muy barato. And it's, it's super, super easy, it's literally like drag and drop and it connects very smoothly. And one campaign type that I'm not sure if any one of you has ever used so far, but it works very well right now. I'm doing it with many local campaigns for Conforama. Who of you knows Conforama? Like the, well, the end of the mueble and esto. And they have 52 different stores in Spain. And what we do is we bring actually like offline traffic, people, like real world people with flesh and bone, we bring them into the physical stores with this kind of campaign type. It's called local store traffic. Uh, well, traffic in negocio. And it works very well. Who of you has ever run an ad it's like that? And for the restaurant, that's of course amazing. Like of course we could, we could connect, connect the phone numbers, we could have a chatbot and stuff. But wouldn't it be amazing if we could customize our ads for each of the different restaurants or each of the different uh, Conforama stores? We will have for example, a carousel ad with one specific card, which shows the exact restaurant location in a Google Maps uh, card. So if they click on it, it will open up Google Maps, you will see exactly how far it is away from you. And this ad also has specific call to action buttons, like how to get there, uh, bless you, how to get there. And it also has a call now button. So I went either of them, you know, they have one CTA, but either of them. and. I mean, that's of course pretty cool for our restaurant. Everyone who is nearby my restaurant will, will be targeted by this specific ad, showing exactly on the map that you're super close to this restaurant. You can also work not with daily budget, but with lifetime budget. Okay, and with lifetime budgets, you could then set up different schedules. So for example, I would only run this ad for the restaurant, let's say between 12 and uh, 3.30 p.m. Let's say three between 12 and 30, uh, between 12 and 3 p.m. Only people close to this restaurant showing exactly <clears throat> that you're super close to the restaurant and with one button, you could uh, call and make a reservation. And I would combine this 
with our amazing uh, local targeting that I've already shown you, that you can put in the tag here, for example, to the restaurant, and then you simply select people are very close to you, and it's very likely that they're gonna show up uh, at the restaurant, they're gonna eat something, because people tend to eat between 12 and 3 p.m., and if they're close by the restaurant and stuff. Now, that's what I would do at the uh, prospecting conversion level, and then everyone, either they have come to my lead generation funnel or they walk through my, through my messenger chatbot or they have come to my website and they have not yet made a reservation, they will receive my retargeting ads. And in retargeting, what you want to communicate is scarcity. And scarcity basically is the famous FOMO effect. Who here knows what FOMO stands for? And what does it mean? Fear of missing out. Exactly, and what does it mean, fear of missing out? Like you wanna be like, oh man, Exactly. How, how would you say it? Do this one or no? Uh, okay. Yeah. So you don't want to lose the specific opportunity that you have in Germany to say here and now moment. Okay. If it's not here and now, oh, I, I will lose it. And when we're in Facebook, Instagram, it's push marketing and not pull marketing. So nobody's really searching for us. We don't have latent demand. We're creating demand. So it's very good to create this here and now moment that they really want to convert now and not later. And what do you think about the traffic objective for that? See or not? Because I also would not recommend it either, not on branding, on prospecting, also not so much on, on retargeting level. If my goal now in the restaurant is that we assume that we have online booking, we can reserve the table online, and they have already come to my website, they already started the reservation process, but they did not end up really clicking on reserve now, well then I retarget them, retarget them with my objective that they convert, that they really end up reserving. And uh, let me also share with you briefly, because Andreas also already about to start, is how could the perfect ad look on this specific layer? Uh, who of you has heard about AIDA? Who of you knows what AIDA stands for? What does it mean? Borja, I don't know. Attention. Like attention, interest, desire, action. And it basically is like the neurological process that every human being goes through in every single purchase decision. Okay? Of course, many of these steps could be almost, simul almost simul simultaneously and they could work very fast, even in parallel almost, but everyone has to be aware of what they have to offer, they have to be interested, they have to get desire from what they actually sell, and they have to take action. Okay? And what I try to do with my retargeting ads, is that I try to get their attention with a question. For example, ¿Todavía tienes hambre? ¿Qué sé? ¿Lo invento? ¿Todavía tienes hambre? ¿Te apetece una pizza italiana? ¿Yo qué sé? Um, now we have a specific offer, but we, we, we still have two seats left. Scarcity, only two seats available, <coughs> or whatever. And click here to uh, reserve your seat right now. Little trick for you, if you include already clickable link in the text, it will increase your click for rate by 10 to 15%. So you have to copy, and typically everyone just puts in the destination URL here in the call to action button. But what I do in my ads, I don't know if you have uh, realized, but my ads typically always say, uh, well, no, Facebook, Instagram, is masterclass, this is the contenido, get your tickets here, and I already put a link inside the copy. Okay. It's such an easy trick to put in the copy inside there, and it increases your click for it. Another trick that increases your click increases your click for it is if you work with images and also if you work with videos, increasing the contrast. That's something that Laura likes a lot, like increasing the contrast because it's so easy to apply. Like I look almost like an orange on this on this image here, but it converts better because we just increase the contrast of the image. Previous it was it did not really stick out so much; it was more like gray tone and stuff. Now I look more like an orange, and it converts better. Customer journey retargeting basically means if you have come to my website and have not converted, the last thing that you want to do is you want to show your customers one and the same ad over uh, half a year now. Okay, that's not gonna work. If you come to my website, you almost convert, and now I reimpact you 180 times every day once with the same ad. It's not a good idea. It's better to do customer journeys. For example, the day one, after you have almost converted, I show you one specific message on day two, another, day three, another, day four, and of course, this could be phases, and not specific days. 
For example, phase one could be from day one to day three, phase two could be from day four to four, day four to four seven, uh, till day seven. And in a restaurant, for example, we could say like, wow, that's our amazing uh, what a plato de estrella. That's our number one dish that we have. Ah, still didn't make a reservation. Day two, we say, tenemos una estrella Michelin. Bueno, quizás, si lo tenemos. Perfecto. Uh, day three, we have the best Italian cook, super authentic, se llama Luigi, and this is how he looks like. Whatever, that's his personal story. Day four, discount. Okay? And you would not work with discounts already in the first days, because people tend to convert, not immediately, they tend to convert anyways after one, two, or three days. If you, if you give them discounts already from the first moment on, you're basically just burning your margins. Okay? But, if they have already gone through all this process, have not converted yet before I'm losing them, it's the final option. I would probably work, maybe not always reducing the price, but adding something to, adding some value to the price, free shipping, uh, two for one, well, two for one is a lot, but um, like an additional strap for a watch or whatever. Last phase, and then I finally give it over to Andrea, is the up and cross sell phase. We want to communicate loyalty, okay? And what do you think about the traffic campaign now? Yes or no? No, no I'm not a fan of traffic campaigns. I am really not. It's really almost burning your budget, okay? Because you pay more for the impressions, because there's a lot of demand for them, and they do not convert, okay? So it's not ideal. And what I would do here now is, I mean, I would love to have millions of people in my upsell campaigns, but it's not reality. Reality is that you have like hundreds or thousands of customers, okay? So it's a very small audience. And with a small audience, not even conversion campaigns tend to work that properly, because what a conversion campaign does is it takes your entire audience, that's it, well, all of you are clients, are customers for a masterclass. And I can run now an upsell campaign to you for the next masterclass, for example. But you are not thousands of people, you're like 70 people. And what a conversion campaign would do now is it would really search for ones and zeros, people within these 70 people who are already converting into the sale for the next masterclass or whatever, and it would not show the ad to the remaining part. Let's imagine that two of you already sign up, you also sign up, and it would stay in this area here, and it would not show the ad to the rest of you. But when it comes to an up or cross sell campaign, everyone matters. Like literally everyone. I want to make sure that I reach Daniel, I reach Andrea, I reach everyone. Every single one, because all of you are customers. So every one of you is already very interesting to me. And the way to do it is with a reach campaign. And the big advantage from a reach campaign is that's the only campaign type where I can really manually oblige Facebook to not uh, surpass a specific level of frequency. So frequency means if I show you my, ad, if, you, if you receive my ad in one week seven times, well, uh, the frequency is seven for this person. So frequency is the impressions divided by reach. How many impressions did I have? Seven, but the reach is just one, or just one person. So seven divided by one would be a frequency of seven, which is already very high uh, in, in, this, in this phase here. So what I would recommend is, for example, something like three impressions every week, something like that. So this, that's the only way to really cap the frequency. And to end this presentation, uh, in order to create loyalty and increase the lifetime value of your customer, for example, at Tagliatelle, what they do is they show here, for example, new restaurants that they have opened. For example, I'm a huge fan of La Tagliatelle, and I t tend to go to two of these of their restaurants, and they open up a new one close to my house, and they show me this ad, and I'm like, oh, that's actually a smart campaign, so they target me now with the new restaurant open close to my place, then they have a newsletter, follow us on Instagram for new offers, or they try to uh, hook me somehow. And where did I get all of these ads from? Where did I find the ads from, from a competitor? How can I find it? Where can I see the ads? Exactly, in the ads library. And that's the last part that I wanted to do with you now before I hand over to Andrea. Everyone takes out his or her phone, okay? And all the, all the Instagram news, well, let, let's everyone just opens up the browser, please, okay? Just Safari or Google Chrome or whatever. And just search for this, for this URL here, facebook.com slash ads, como anuncio, slash library, como biblioteca. 
Okay, you have it? Everyone has it? Facebook.com slash ads slash library. Who, who has it? Say, just say yes or something. Okay, very good. And what we, what, I, what we could do is we could search for this handsome gentleman here. So Patrick Wynn. And then what you could do there is you could scroll through all of the ads that I have active right now. Okay. And why am I showing you this trick? Well, on the one hand, because I want you to criticize my ads. I want you to take a look at them and really maybe you can even learn something from it. Maybe you see something that you do not like, then tell me because I want to improve. Second, you could easily you could easily you could easily spy on your actual competitors. Let's say you're Coca-Cola and you want to see the ads that Pepsi runs right now. You just go to the ads library and they're obliged to see it. Can you see the result of the ad? No. And that was a trick with Instagram that used to show you at least the level of video views, the level of uh, engagement, but it's gone unfortunately for one month. And I had it in my webinar and stuff, so we had to do, redo the webinar, which was amazing. <laughs> it only took us two and a half months yeah. in English and in Spanish and in Russian. Amazing. Okay, so first you can criticize my ad and, pro ad and probably you see something that you can also take for, for your ads. Second, you can spy on your competitors. And third, who of you has bought something on Black Friday or Christmas online? Okay, yeah. wasn't it great to have a discount, right? So it's cool to shop online with a discount. From this specific moment on, every one of you will always have a discount when you shop online. Okay, because what you want to do is before you shop in the e-commerce page of whatever, Meller or Hawkers or the Wellington, whatever, what you do is you go to the ads library, you search for this page, search for the Facebook page of this company, and you scroll through the ads, because ever since Cambridge Analytica, they are legally obliged to publicly show all of their ads. And all of the ads includes their prospecting ads and also their retargeting ads. And what many of these companies do in retargeting is they offer discounts. So the last 10 times that I bought online, 10 times I, bought a, I found a discount code in here. Okay? They found them before they launched. Well, they, they so you, know, you know when, when they have discounts, so what discounts they have? Exactly, so basically whatever kind, exactly before they target me, before I even, I mean, the old, the old game uh, used to be, well, I enter the shopping cart, I do not purchase, and then I wait until they target me with the retargeting ads. That used to be the old game, but that's not necessary anymore. You can just go there directly and see all of the retargeting ads and they have active for everyone. You just take the discount code and buy there. So, to sum up, and finally give it to our amazing uh, creative content director, um, the full funnel strategy is a suggestion that I would like to give you where you communicate an emotional message on branding level, a rather message towards conversion prospecting level, retargeting scarcity, and on the upper cost level, you want to increase the loyalty, to increase the lifetime value of your customer. And the last sentence I would like to share with you before I hand over is, all the technical stuff is cool, all the technical stuff is important, but what really matters is that you focus on the right audience, that you get their attention with the right video creative that we're going to learn now, and that you convince them with the right copy. So thank you very much, and let's give over to Andrea. Thank you very much, Patrick, for inviting me and for this lovely audience that we have tonight. Um, so yeah, my name is Andrea Mas, I'm the Creative Content Director. I help produce most, well, I'd say everything, yeah. that, that Patrick has from webinars to all the valuable content that you see recently on his YouTube page. Um, so before we even begin, I want to go through a little bit about my background, at least very brief. I'm from Miami, um, I did my bachelor's degree there in digital video and film, thinking that maybe I would end up working some sometime in Hollywood. But after I did that, I realized that I actually like working a lot better with small businesses, medium-sized businesses, and producing content for them. So I decided to move here to Barcelona, where I studied my MBA. And 15 months later, I finished with that as well. So I decided to put my creativity and the fact that I wanted to run my own business to, to good use. And I came up with my own company called Mesa Media Works registered in Miami. And um, so now we produce content. Okay, thank you, Patrick. Good evening, everyone. 
So my name is Hugo Descalzo, Hugo Descalzo, if you like it. Uh, I'm the co-founder and CEO of Antilog, which is our little baby startup. And tonight I'm going to tell you how we created the full funnel strategy for our company from scratch. So first about the project. It started about two years ago, around February. I was selling these hoverboard, uh, auto-balanced uh, hoverboards for teenagers and crappy electric scooters at a company. And I really thought that hoverboards were just a trend for teenagers for about one, two years, but I didn't believe it was the future of uh, electric transportation. So uh, my boss didn't agree with me and I wanted to do some things differently and do the real thing. So I talked to the designer who was thinking like me and I said, hey, let's leave this place. Let's make our own company and let's sell actual adults electric vehicles that are high quality and that we can uh, actually use in cities like Barcelona. So I left uh, to China uh, to look for MVP, a minimum valuable product. I came back one month later with a foldable, super light, pretty decent electric scooter, an amazing foldable electric bike that I really love to use and a prototype for electric skateboard that we haven't launched yet. So we started working on website, branding, we had everything, the electric mobility, which is sustainable, a cool naming and logo, modern uh, responsive website. We had uh, collaborations with NGOs to clean the waters and plant trees and everything that all modern companies do nowadays. A proper Instagram feed with beautiful pictures, even before launching and having the product. And so he said, okay, we have it. We have the platform, we have the product, we have the branding, let's start with the funnel. So I didn't know about the Patrick's full funnel strategy at that time, but I had my concepts about how a sales funnel worked. I had my um, business management degree, e-commerce masters. So I knew the first thing we had to say is, hey, we are Antilop, we're here, we are an amazing brand. We have a product that you really need and we are gonna desire. So uh, come and have a look at our website. So we hired a Norwegian uh, filmmaker to start attack the right side of the brain that Patrick said, the emotional side. Uh, we made some cool videos about the, the bike, the scooter, to try and start running our first branding and prospecting ad. So we wanted as many people as possible to come to our website, have a look at the pictures, at the product, and see if they were interested to grab them by the cookie with the pixel and make some retargeting later on. So we run these prospecting ads with both the videos, different copies, different creativities, A-B testing with uh, banners, with uh, early bird discounts, plain images, different texts, and then, as I said, uh, start the retargeting campaigns to attack the left side of the brain, the more rational side. So again, we did different copies, very limited amount of units, fear of missing out for our alpha testers with a hard discount, the early bird discount I was uh, mentioning earlier for a broader audience. Uh, we even found a retailer shop in Barcelona so that people could go and have a free demo, see the product, test the product to break all those barriers about buying a 1,300 euro bike online without having touched it, and so on. And the trick was done. Cool. We just had to grab everyone's money, right? Well, we didn't. We sold one bike and no scooters after three weeks of ads running on Facebook. So in these kind of conferences, people usually come to tell you about their amazing story, uh, how cool their company are, how well they're sold, and how beautiful it is, so you can relate and think, hey, I'm going to do the same thing and be super rich. But I think it's way more constructive to see how something that looks well executed can be completely wrong by some simple, really small mistakes that you can avoid with the full funnel strategy. <laughs> so let's see what went wrong with the strategy. First thing, the campaign goal, traffic. I wanted as many users as possible to come to the website. So I set up a traffic goal for our first campaigns which means I was going for these amazing six people only, these people that never buy, and I was nurturing my pixel to do retargeting on these six people also. 
So even the retargeting campaign were set as conversions, they're taking the people from the traffic uh, goal that I was setting in the, in the branding campaigns. Second of all, formats. I was going old school with the horizontal Facebook format, vertical for Instagram, which is good for Instagram feed, but awful for stories. Why? Because it's not big enough to go full screen, but it's big enough to screw up the copy. So you can only see four words. Whereas if you use a square caption, you can see the full sentence underneath. And if you notice on Facebook, you can also use the same square caption and you get twice the size for the same price. So it's half of the work because you're using the same banner for both of them. And it's amazing for all the different sections of Facebook and Instagram. So what are the best formats for digital advertising? Vertical four or five relation is best for Instagram and Facebook feed. And the full screen obviously is the best for stories. But if you don't have time or resources to do as many different kinds of uh, images and design, then go for the square one-to-one -one relation because it's perfect for all the different uh, placements. I think there's one network, uh, like uh, audio network, audience network where it doesn't apply, but the other eight or nine positions, uh, square format is perfect. So you really optimize with this one. Third mistake was the conversion window. I was hoping for people to pay 1,300 bucks for something barely two weeks after knowing that we exist. So how much time does it go between you hear BMW the first time in your life and you actually buy a car, you know? I was panicking because my money was leaving every day, my budget was going away and people were not buying. I was like, okay, let's pause, let's change the audience, let's do another pricing or a new discount or new banners or whatever. And I was simply not giving enough time to people to actually know us, interact with our Instagram, get some newsletters, uh, see the product page, get a retargeting, whatever. So don't rush so much. People need time to buy. <coughs> and the fourth one was that my funnel was actually a chinois sieve, which means that I was pouring water on top without closing the gaps and the holes at the bottom. I was doing retargeting only uh, based on page views, people that was going to my website and looking at the, at the product description. But I could go way more narrower. I could go for people that looked at 75% of the video of the first ad or people that spent uh, three minutes on my website or that looked at three different pages or whatever. So I was going for a very, very broad audience uh, without grabbing all the people that were leaving maybe with an add to cart which is way hot, hotter than people that just had a look at the, at the product description. And so that's it. Uh, that combined with some offline mistakes, like not having enough budget or having a wrong uh, team or not giving enough time to this company, dedicating enough time because I have other projects uh, apparently. Uh, led to not selling uh, as much as we wanted. So a good enough social ad strategy is not good enough. It has to be perfect. Because if you spend ages designing audiences and banners and copies, but you set up the wrong goal, you screw up everything, for example. So that's why you have to take the Ads Accelerator uh, online program <laughs> and know all the secrets of Facebook and Instagram strategies so you don't screw up. And that's it. Thank you very much. Wow. Um, as you probably know, it's like the 20th time that we're doing these kind of formations. And I thought, let's see how it works with like guest speakers, like four of them. And I'm super happy. It's like the level of information that also Andrea and Hugo that shared really with you guys, that it, I mean, it really makes a difference. I mean, you can have someone here who tells you like, ah, whatever, do ABC, and that's it. But he like invested a couple of thousand of euros in ads, it didn't work for him, and he analyzed exactly what it was that went wrong. That's really valuable information. You save these thousands of euros in running your unnecessary B tests, <coughs> right? And all of the conclusions that, that you have gained, that's amazing. Like, I'm really, really happy that you shared all of this with us. And let's do like two or three questions, if you have them. Um, Hi, 
Hi, really great presentation. Thanks for sharing it. And since you put an emphasis on setting the right goal, and I, I didn't catch them. I know what, everything you said, but from your experience, then how did you improve that? How did you know at which point to predict, to select which goal? <laughs> and uh, if you can continue maybe answering that question and answer specifically for this event and for Eventbrite events in general, which would be the ideal campaign uh, objective. I'll do the Benny Pride one because I have quite some experience on that. And you just. Yeah, okay. Well, now if I had to do it again, I would uh, based that uh, half of the branding campaigns were videos. I would set up uh, some audiences based on the video views, uh, percentage of the video that you've saw, seen from the first ad. And the other ones I would set uh, interaction or straight to conversion, even if it's a branding campaign. Because at least it's focusing on people that usually buy online. Even if it's fewer people, it's more quality. Okay. I, I would also like to say two things. So, the bright stuff, uh, but like the four levels in the funnel, like branding, prospecting, retargeting, hub and cross sell, it's nice to do branding campaigns. It's all good. But if you have limited budget, right? If you spend less than 1,000 euros per month, or even if you spend significantly less than 3,000 euros per month, which is like 100 euro per day, then I would probably skip the first level. I would probably not run branding ads. I would do branding in an organic way. So branding is very important. Okay, there's one quote, uh, who here knows the comparison between like marketing and branding. So marketing is like asking a girl for a date and branding is the reason why she says yes. Okay, and it's true, like without any branding, you could impact everyone with like, nah, okay, I'm the new BMW, I'm the new BMW, but nobody's gonna end up buying. So branding is important, but if you have limited budget available, then do it organically. Then do a lot of cooperations with influencers. You could give your amazing product to like the five, six YouTubers and Instagram influencers that really matter in your niche. They can test it for free because it's a 1,300 euro product, but if you have like these watches or sunglasses, they cost you basically, well, the watch is not, but the sunglasses, the shipping is more expensive than the variable cost of the product many times. So in these scenarios, if you sell like bracelets, or if you sell whatever on them, then just do a lot of influencer marketing, send it to all of them for free and get organic reach in the beginning for free or do a lot of sorteos like lotteries, you can win something, but do the organic part uh, for free and then go directly with what you just said, like video view campaign is great, engagement campaign is great, but if I, if I only have my 1,000 euros or my 2,000 or 3,000, whatever, then I go directly to a conversion campaign, optimize for purchase or a cart or whatever, and I want to nurture the pixel with exactly the right people. Because as you said, then the retargeting traffic, the people who went to your website and stuff, is also much cleaner because you only bring people with high probability to end up buying. You would never have reached, uh, sorry for that, well, they have changed. But like <laughs> these, these six people would from the beginning on already attract the right people. If you spend significantly more, or if you're a big brand like ASICs, of course with ASICs we do a lot of branding ads, then you buy in the physical store, but who of you has the same marketing budget like ASICs? Like I don't. And not many, not many companies have. So if you like on the limit, if you're on the limited budget, then skip the branding level, go directly to prospecting with conversion objective, and try to get sales. And actually, the entire funnel, when I start uh, with my audits, when I start uh, well analyzing, I don't know if you've seen where, where, where's our Slovakian friend. Perfect. I don't know if you've seen my video like a week ago. Someone asked. Patrick, when you get access to a new ad account, how do you audit it? How do you, what's like the first three, four, five things that I take a look at it? And the first thing that I typically take a look at is if they have set up the retargeting funnel and upsell, cross-sell funnel properly because that's where people lose money. So it's good that you spend on top of that branding, it's all good, but if your, uh, if your funnel is, how do you call it? Chino I, 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 I could not even pronounce it. Uh, if your funnel is like that, you're wasting money, like a lot, and you should not do it. So first, if you have limited budget, if you have only 1,000 euros or 3,000 euros per month, then rather try to re-impact everyone who has already engaged with you somehow, make money with that, and scale it with some prospecting campaigns. And if you have even more budget, then you do branding. Okay? Philip. That 
sets. So what I did in the past is I tried to mess them up between the different things and then I had a call with the Facebook account manager like a month ago and she was like, Patrick, what are you doing? And I'm like, hey, it works. And she's like, yeah, but it doesn't make any sense from a technical point of view to mix them. So I'm like, yeah, okay, let's try it differently and it works a little bit better now, okay? So official recommendation from Facebook, if you want to test, for example, an interest-based audience, you want to test lookalike audiences, which is something that Juan is going to talk about in like two minutes, okay? So interest-based, like people interested in digital marketing, people interested in whatever, okay? People interested in social media. Lookalike audience, and another one very broad, Facebook does not recommend to mix them up in the same campaign. You rather have a specific campaign for your broad audiences, a specific campaign for your lookalike audiences, and a specific campaign for your interest-based audience. Of course, you want to have several audiences within each of these campaigns, one audience for digital marketing, one for social media, one for small and medium-sized entrepreneurs, one lookalike based on your purchases, one lookalike based on your to cards, one lookalike based on your best purchase, people who have bought two times, whatever. And another one that's broad, only for men, only for women, only in Catalonia, only in Galicia, whatever you want. But they do not recommend to put them in the same campaigns. But these are very, very good questions that we should definitely talk uh, in the networking part later if you still want to stay here let's have, let's let, let's give also the chance to the other ones so if you have one more question to Hugo that could be relevant to everyone I'm really curious about targeting because you mentioned you were selling these uh, thousand one thousand three hundred scooters so my question is how were you targeting people with higher household incomes because interest or look like don't actually um, acknowledge the fact that people can, are actually able to afford it. So I'm interested if about tree plants and kind of. Do you remember? I told you. Yeah, I told you three of them. Let's see how many you remember. Yeah. See. <laughs> well, I didn't target uh, high-income households for for our branding campaign, but what I did is uh, have a pretty broad audience at the beginning, and. Uh, and then when I collected some data on the pixel, I switched the branding audiences with a lookalike audience from people that were going to my website. So if they show interest, the price was on the image of the, of the, of the, ad, of the first ad. So if people are clicking after seeing the price, it means they're not totally uninterested. So I was uh, changing the, the audience with a lookalike. But if I had to target the high income households, what I would do is the drop the pin on the map. You look for the codigos uh, postales of the of the higher uh, income um, neighborhoods in Barcelona, for example, in Madrid, which is in the INE or in Google, and then you can drop pins and narrow uh, with the negative pins next to them. So you could actually go for Calle Pearson and Pedralbes if you wanted. Or the second one is going. Uh, you can filter devices and go for iOS. People that have iPhones usually have a higher income than uh, Android. And the third one, I don't know if I remember. Oh, okay, yeah, the educational level. If they have a master's degree or uh, just a degree at university, then uh, they probably have a, a higher income. So. That's a very good question, especially when you're scaling your business, for example, to South America. Anyone of you is from South America? Uh, I actually love it a lot. Um, but the problem is if you sell, for example, online courses, their purchasing power tends to be lower than in Spain or in Germany or in the United States. Okay? So, but there are, of course, still people with, high, with, with decent or high purchasing power also in South America. But it really matters if you target, like I work in four, countries in, in Latin America. I work in Mexico, in Colombia, in Peru, and in Chile. These are the four countries that tend to work very well in South America, like Argentina, Brazil. <coughs> they, do, they do not work for me, okay? But the four countries I mentioned, they work. But to be honest, I have to apply these three filters. I only target um, people in the rich areas, in the capital cities, and only in the rich uh, uh, barrios, not everyone only in the rich uh, barrios, uh, barrios uh, neighborhoods. 
and then only impact people with iOS device, which is something that we could discuss now because Google, for example, is definitely has some purchasing power and he has, he's an Android user, agree. But in general, worldwide, if you take iOS users wise, Android users, he is a higher purchasing power. And I also agree that there are iPhone users who, do, who, do, who could not even afford the iPhone, but still, in general, there is a higher purchasing power, especially when you run campaigns worldwide. And like a worldwide campaign targets people in India, targets people in Pakistan, which is perfectly fine. If you have high purchasing power, they can afford my course. I, like I sold many courses in India and it's all good. It's all good, but you want to reach people that could afford this course. If not, it's a waste of your budget. And the third is once again discussable. Many successful entrepreneurs who have never uh, stepped into university agree, but in general, having a university degree is an indicator for higher purchasing power. So these are the three things that you could and you should do, especially when you target outside of Spain. Well, let's give a very warm applause to this amazing gentleman. Here. But um, I feel that most people who like tango, that doesn't necessarily mean that they, you know, or maybe they go and dance tango in their city, but that doesn't mean that they're gonna travel to tango. Um, and so I would like to get in touch with the people that travel constantly to tango festivals, for example. Is there a way, because, um, like, can I get into what uh, events that they've been to or places, you know, pages that they've liked as a way to target those people who travel with Tango? A very good question. Any one of you has an amazing answer to that? See? Hang up, or it doesn't matter. No, it's not an easy question. See, Alberto, all right. But he's a DJ, he's a, like, a, you, don't, you do not know it, but he's probably the most famous person in this room. <laughs> you, you, you most likely listen to one or two of his songs on Spotify. <laughs> More famous than you. Yeah, I, mean. <laughs> uh, yeah, I think yeah, uh, you can you can share uh, through a um, tool on Facebook a similar audience like people loving um, stuff related to tango, for instance, in the general Facebook inside, right? It's like a tip. Maybe you, yeah, you also recommend that. So in general, it's not an easy task. In general, it's not like that Facebook, uh, you know, that you can target people that like tango and that like to travel for a tango retreat and I want only use it those no, it's, it's difficult. So the answer is, there is no such an audience. But, as Alberto said, there are many hacks, there are many tricks that you could apply to do this. For example, you could still target people that are interested in tango. I think it's not a bad idea and it's going to be a broad one, okay? So that's the first thing. Then you could apply it. So. Uh, in the detailed segmentation part, you remember you could add different interests, but these are uh, mathematically uh, or conditions. Okay? Or they're interested in tango, or they're interested in yoga, or they're interested in digital marketing, whatever. And either they fall in one category or the other, they all come together. So you could have like these eight people that are interested in tango, these four people interested in yoga, these six people interested in uh, digital marketing. And if I create a typical audience where we have like this one and this one and this one, I would target like 14 people. It's okay, but what if I would be interested only in you? Because you fall in all three categories. You're apparently interested in digital marketing, you are very interested in tango, and then you're also interested in yoga. And I want this person, and he's the only one who falls into all three categories. There is like an overlaps between all three interests. And the way to set it up is instead of doing or conditions, so instead of just adding them, you want to click on narrow down the audience. Okay, there is exclude and there's narrow down. You click on narrow down the audience and then it change, changes from an or condition. Or condition, that's what we do on top. It changes to an and condition, which is what happens rather below there, okay? So we want to select them people that are interested in tango and they're also interested in yoga and they're also interested in digital marketing. 
that's what you could play around. You could also, one of the additional filters is people who have recently traveled. That's what I would test. So that we take people that tend to travel. So people, for example, that are interested in time work and tend to travel a lot, for example. But it's not an easy task. I would mainly, so there's also one important thing. So of course, I'm here like the, the Facebook Instagram at student stuff, but there are also, uh, there are also products and services that typically work better in Google, or typically work better in YouTube or in Amazon. Like this one, I don't know, like we, we should of course test, and I, I'm, like it's very visual, so I think it's gonna work. But in general, you have to know when Facebook and Instagram is, is the right platform. Because for example, like the mineral, uh, you know, like there's a patent that takes, so, so the, the woman over there is a very, a very important uh, scientist that takes out the minerals from the sea has a patent for that and sells it as like vitamins, okay? Could, could work in Facebook ads, could also work in other platforms. Maybe, um, let's take another example. Let's take an example of someone who searches for a hotel in Barcelona tonight, okay? There's a latent demand for to really stay, maybe some of you is gonna stay longer, have a beer afterwards and doesn't want to go home, well then searches for a hotel tonight. There's a latent demand for this specific product to service right now, staying in a hotel tonight and you search for it on Google, okay? And that's where you need to be, and then you can retarget the people with Facebook and Instagram ads, you can retarget them in the Google Display Network, whatever, but there are some products or services that rather tend to be very well executed with push marketing with Facebook and Instagram ads, and others that rather perform better with pull marketing. So I would personally do, I would invest quite a lot in Google search ads. So if everyone who searches in whichever country searches for, uh, uh, Tango Retreat, Tango Retreat Spain, Tango Retreat Barcelona, Tango Retreat International, that's where you need to be. That's where you need to be when someone also already self-declared him or herself to be interested in that, in traveling there, that's where you need to be. And if the person comes to your website and doesn't purchase or doesn't call you or doesn't send you an email, then you have a proper retargeting fund with the customer journey retargeting that I've shown you. On day one you show, hey, the location is amazing in Barcelona. On day two you say, best teacher in Europe. Number three, Barcelona is great. You're gonna have a great time. Step four, discount, sign up today or you're, or you're out. Yeah. So that's what I would, that's the way I would do it. So I actually normally put like uh, posts in groups of like festivals in Europe or something like that, that my reach is really bad. So is there a way that I can get more in touch with the people that are members <coughs> of those groups by paying or? The groups, unfortunately, so far is not a targeting option. They they said that it's going to be a targeting option six months ago, said it two months ago, but it's not there. Who of you is, anyone of you is able to target groups? Based on Instagram ads, I'm not yet. So uh, they said there's going to be a better to really target this in that groups, but so far it's not. But they said it's going to be a possibility. Now, we still have two amazing guest speakers. How about your energy level? Like from, from one to 10, are you still like rather a 10 or not so much? Who, who is like already uh, just watching the reloj para irse a casa? No? Bueno, pues ya lo puedes decir, es que no, no me enfado ni nada. No, but two of you is like still super motivated for two amazing guest speakers. Who is like really motivated? Yeah. Woo! Yeah, no, see that? Yeah. Okay, so that's the perfect moment for a commercial break because I'm gonna. I wanted to pitch you the Ads Accelerator program, but I rather prefer to skip that and keep continuing with the content. So, and there's, there's also price pitch and stuff, so whatever. So that's just our problem. I do it very quickly, okay, because I'm too lazy to go outside, because I know that the PowerPoint is not gonna open properly, so just go do that. So our program, basically a six week program on advanced Facebook and Instagram ads, and we learn everything that you need to learn when it comes to advanced, uh, knowledge to apply the full funnel strategy. You have tools and checklists. You have well, all of these hacks. That's the supporting that we have in the back. Um, well, that helps you with all your questions because I bought so many online courses and at the end, uh, if you have some individual questions, nobody's there to really answer you. That's what I wanted to set up before you. So we have a Facebook group and which is very cool, we have a WhatsApp group, okay? So who of you is actually, who, who of you forms part of this WhatsApp group? Yeah. yeah, and it really helps, right? So it's like if you have a friend, a colleague, a family member that really knows about this topic, so what would you do? Like what would you do if, if I would be your best friend? Would you send me an email? 
I know you would, you would call me, but I don't take phone calls at all. The life hack, like my phone is always on airplane mode for the last three years. It's always on airplane mode. If they want somebody to contact me on WhatsApp, that's not that I, you know, like I'm super important or anything, but it's just a life hack that changes your life from being passive to an active mode where you can decide what to do with your time. It's always on airplane mode, always. So I wouldn't take the phone call because it's an airplane mode. So they would typically write me on WhatsApp. They would send me a what, uh, voicemail, they would send me a video, they would send me a screen recording. And that's what we do. That's what we do in our groups. We have one in Spanish, one in English. And that's where the real value is. Like, of course, like 25 hours of content. But then the real value is in the support group where you really can ask all of the technical questions. You can send some screenshots like, hey, what should I do? Like, my results suck. What can I do? Like, hey, what have you done so far? I don't know. Hey, let me help you. Hey, uh, whatever doesn't get approved. And then we just help you. And it's really, really valuable. So our program, it's a six-week online course, over 25 hours of know-how. And you have four amazing bonuses, like one year of mastermind coaching, this WhatsApp and Facebook group, you get all my tools and checklists. You can promote yourself if you're, who of you is a digital marketing freelancer, or as an agency, or why not? Yes, let us see. Bueno, todas las personas, o cual mismo, les hacen los alumnos, ¿no? Sí. Sí, claro. ¿Por qué? Porque tienen cual. We have a page where every freelancer and consultant who passes through our program can promote him or her with his services to get new clients. So the way you really, uh, well, you can um, amortizar la inversión en nuestro programa rapidamente. So, and at the end, you also receive an official certificate for LinkedIn and stuff. And the amazing value that we provide here is at least 3,000 euros with 1,500 of the six week program, the 24 7 support community, all of my tools and checklists, and the Academy Alumni page where you can promote yourself. Did you get clients there or not? Lo tiene que decir ahora, ¿no? Bueno, pero, sí, creo que sí. Y un certificado LinkedIn. Y el valor, uh, the 3,000 euros, if you're here in this amazing masterclass, you get, of course, a discount. And the special offer for tonight's masterclass is only 790 euros. So if any one of you would be interested, today is a good moment to ask to me, uh, to, ask, to talk to me afterwards, to talk to Andrea, to, ask, uh, to talk with Hugo, with Juan. Uh, all of them have done our formation, and all of the other guys have raised their hand, they've passed through this formation, and it really helps you if you want to become an expert on Facebook and Instagram. It's, and that's my little sales pitch. If you're interested, just talk to us, and we'll send you the link, and we'll send you more information. And if you're new to Facebook and Instagram ads, no worries. There's a complete beginner step-by-step -step kind of over six hours where I show you step-by-step -step every single thing, that's every single button that you have to press to make these campaigns work. And if you're already a pro and you're like, eh, I don't know if there's something new to me, I'm very convinced that there's something new because all of these masterclasses we record and they'll upload in the course, all of the new stuff is there. And for example, like five CBO hacks that we've also developed over the past uh, months are also in there. We have some chatbot settings. I'm going to show you how to set it up in less than 20 minutes. Proper lead generation funnel, A-B testing, a mini course about commercial rate optimization, the meet that we did in Desigual when it comes to Black Friday and Saturday Monday. So a lot of advanced stuff is also included in the program. Now, testimonials, we're going to skip. Even though the, even though Warfare tiene una cara bellísima, but we're still going to skip that. And yeah, it's not just for e-commerce, it's for agencies, freelancers, everyone related to digital marketing should know about advanced Facebook and Instagram, and that's the ideal way to do it. You sell info products like our online course, if you generate leads for real estate, or even for job recruiters. And, lo mejor de todo, está disponible completamente en español, también. Y ahora, os paso a Juan, que prefiere hacerlo en español la charla, por eso cambio así y tal. Y vamos a dar un aplauso a Juan. Venga. Bueno, voy a hacer la charla en español. ¿Alguien no entiende español de aquí? Patrick, te lo explicamos mucho. Bueno, yo soy, soy Juan, soy alumno de Patrick desde hace año y poquito. Y bueno, yo he utilizado todo el conocimiento que hay aquí en este curso para crear mi propio negocio. Ayudo a gimnasios y centros deportivos a conseguir más clientes y, y bueno, he creado mi propia agencia de marketing digital enfocada en este nicho. ¿no? Y bueno, yo os quiero traer tres trucos clave que a mí me han servido de este programa para conseguir resultados consistentes para mis clientes y los comparto con vosotros. ¿Quién no conoce las que son las lookalike? ¿Alguien no la conoce? 
¿Alguien la conoce? La mayoría, ¿no? ¿Alguien que quiera explicar más o menos qué son? Rapidito. Son, son audiencias parecidas a la gente que, o sea, que ha comprado, que ha interactuado, que ha visto tu vídeo y lo puedes segmentar, pues, gente que ha visto el vídeo de 1 a 3 segundos, gente que ha comprado, gente que ha añadido el gatito. Es audiencias parecidas a eso. Pero se necesita como una gran cantidad de data en el pixel para que funcione, porque si eres una localite de 10 personas, pues no, no sirve de nada. Vale. vale, pues Marek lo ha explicado perfectamente. Eh, las lookalikes son audiencias, Facebook te permite crear audiencias parecidas a un público objetivo. Si nosotros definimos nuestro público objetivo como el público que al final es un cliente que ya nos ha comprado, si tenemos una muestra lo suficientemente grande, le podemos decir a Facebook que nos cree una audiencia parecida a ese público, similar, con, ese, con esos mismos intereses, con esas mismas reacciones, interacciones, y Facebook nos crea una audiencia nos deja un margen de entre el 1 y 10%. Cuanto más nos acercamos al 1% de similitud, es un público muy parecido al público objetivo que hemos segmentado y si nos alejamos a un 10% va a ser gente, personas parecidas a ese público objetivo, pero que realmente no, yo no lo recomiendo. Más de un 4% yo lo veo innecesario, no, no tendría sentido más de un 4%. ¿Vale? Aquí, por ejemplo, ¿vale? he cogido una, una imagen de, de, del curso de Patrick. Aquí hace él una, unas lookalike, ¿vale? una similitud al 1% ¿vale? de Instagram Engagement. ¿vale? Y la otra son de vistas de vídeo en los últimos 7 días. Si os fijáis, ¿vale? El problema de, de las lookalike es que, como os decía, si ponemos un público muy parecido al objetivo, nos queda un público muy reducido, ¿vale? ¿Qué solución tenemos a esto? Crear las super lookalike, ¿vale? Las super lookalike son varias lookalike, dos o más, juntas, ¿vale? Las unimos para crear una, una audiencia más grande. En este caso, hemos, hemos seleccionado estas dos, ¿vale? Instagram Engages y Video Views, de los últimos siete días, y si os fijáis, en una tenemos aquí 250.000 personas y en la otra otras 250.000. ¿Qué pasa? Que aquí Facebook nos dice que de estas dos, 48.000 personas son las mismas, ¿vale? Porque coinciden aquí y coinciden aquí, están en los dos sitios. ¿Qué pasa? Ya nos sirve porque no tendremos 500.000 personas, no, no habremos agrandado nuestra, nuestra audiencia en 500.000 personas, pero sí que la habremos agrandado en pues, 452.000, ¿no? Pues ya está bien. Podemos utilizar y unir todas las lookalikes que queramos, ¿vale? No sé si hay algún límite, tampoco lo he probado nunca, pero yo suelo utilizar entre 3 y 4, ¿vale? Lookalikes, según lo que necesite aumentar mi, mi, mi audiencia, mi público. ¿Vale? Aquí tenéis, tenéis otro ejemplo, ¿vale? Como os decía, os queda, os queda un tamaño, si yo lo pongo al 1%, ¿vale? La Lucalai, nos queda un tamaño muy reducido, de 280.000 personas, ¿vale? Eso en todo España. Imaginaos, por ejemplo, como yo, que, que son anuncios para, para gimnasios, que es publicidad local. Imaginaos a mí la, 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 la audiencia que me quedaría. Me quedaría una audiencia ridícula y no le dejaría margen a, a Facebook para trabajar. Pues, ¿qué hago? Me, en vez de subir el, el porcentaje y coger a gente menos parecida, yo lo que hago es utilizar la super lookalike, ¿vale? Uno, uno varias audiencias parecidas a público objetivo y me hago una audiencia pues, considerable para que dejara Facebook que trabaje. ¿Vale? ¿Qué, ¿Cuál es el, el truco aquí? Si, si todos nos imaginamos un embudo, ¿no? El triangulito, coger audiencias similares a la parte baja del, del embudo, ¿vale? Es decir, no vamos a coger audiencias similares a gente que ha visto un vídeo o gente que ha entrado en tu página. Cogemos audiencias similares a la parte más baja del embudo. Audiencias similares a gente que ha comprado. A gente similar, eh, a gente que, que ya que ha añadido un producto al carrito. Cosas así. Lo más cercano al, 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 al objetivo final que sea nuestro, nuestro comercio. Mi segundo truco, que, que este sí que es, me ha servido muchísimo, son los Dynamic Ads. 
con Dynamica son campañas de contenido dinámico que me sirven a mí para testear cuando, por ejemplo, yo tengo a mí un gimnasio me pasa 10 imágenes, 20 imágenes. Yo no sé cuál funciona mejor, ¿vale? Ni siquiera me puedo hacer la idea y decir, hostia, a mí esta me gusta más. No, no podemos dar nada por hecho, hay que probarlo todo. Y yo lo que hago es meter esas imágenes y, y, y textos, pruebas, en Dynamic Ads. Dynamic Ads te, permi te permite crear una campaña ¿vale? de Facebook con hasta 10 imágenes, 5 textos, 5 títulos y Facebook él solo las combina. ¿vale? Esto lo que nos da, después lo que nos va a dar los resultados, ¿vale? Facebook nos deja desglosar y nos deja ver qué imagen ha sido la que mejor resultado está teniendo. ¿vale? Entonces yo pongo una muestra, por ejemplo, de 10 imágenes y cojo la que más me interesa según una vez hayan pasado un mínimo de cuatro días ¿vale? desde que he arrancado la campaña y ha gastado un presupuesto empiezo a tomar decisiones y cuando veo que una imagen es, pues, es exitosa entonces empiezo a crear campañas individuales con ella ¿vale? aquí os dejo, podéis hacer una foto ¿vale? de, de notas que tengo yo ¿vale? y después de probar tanto y tanto pues es lo que mejor me va cuando queráis probar de cero, ¿vale? que queráis probar qué imagen eh, funciona mejor, qué texto funciona mejor, qué título funciona mejor, qué llamada a la acción funciona mejor, pues yo recomiendo poner máximo dos o tres imágenes o vídeos, dos textos y dos, dos, dos y dos, ¿vale? No pongáis diez, cinco, cinco, porque si la mayoría de veces lo vais a hacer con un presupuesto reducido para ver qué es lo que funciona, y si ponéis demasiado, hay tantas combinaciones posibles que a Facebook no le va a dar tiempo a, a darte un resultado y tú poder tomar decisiones. Entonces hacer dos, dos y dos, ¿vale? Y es la regla que utilizo. Si, por ejemplo, ya tenéis el texto que ya sabéis cuál es el correcto, pero queréis saber, por ejemplo, cuál es la imagen, tenéis 10 imágenes para probar, pues sí que podéis meter el texto que ya sabéis que funciona y le metéis 10 imágenes y a ver cuál funciona mejor de esas 10. Ahí sí que podéis meter más muestras. ¿Vale? El tercer truco es cómo incrementar tu inversión en Facebook ¿vale? sin perder rentabilidad. ¿Cuál es el, uno de los problemas que, que me enfrentaba yo cuando, cuando empezaba con mis clientes? ¿no? Que empezaba a hacer una campaña, hacía dos Dynamics, veía qué imagen iba mejor, empezaba a hacer las campañas con lo que mejor funcionaba y luego cuando encontraba algo que funcionaba bien, me encontraba con que a lo mejor hacía una campaña de, no sé, 10, 20 los diarios y, y si quería incrementar el gasto en esa, en esa misma campaña, me encontraba que la rentabilidad empezaba a bajar. Es decir, empezaron a entrar menos leads, menos resultados, ¿vale? ¿Por qué es esto? Porque Facebook, nosotros lo que hacemos en Facebook para, para evitar esto es el horizontal scaling, ¿vale? En vez de incrementar todo el gasto, que si queremos pasar, por ejemplo, de 20 euros diarios a 50, pues en vez de incrementar esos 30 euros de diferencia en ese mismo anuncio que ya te está funcionando, lo que vamos a hacer es duplicarlo, ¿vale? Y aplicarlo horizontalmente. Creamos dos o tres copias. ¿Y cómo lo hacemos? Con un pequeñito cambio, ¿vale? Aplicamos cambios de un... Empezamos con un cambio de un euro en el presupuesto. Si estamos gastando 20, pues le ponemos 21, 22, no más. Esto lo que nos da es alargar la vida útil de, de ese anuncio, de ese copy y todo, y, y que rinda mucho más tiempo, ¿vale? Siempre ir haciendo copias de los anuncios y las campañas que funcionan bien, ¿vale? Digamos que, que los anuncios tienen un ADN, ¿vale? Si funciona bien, tiene un ADN positivo, que digo yo, ¿vale? Esto es una idea que, que, que me hago yo así para que lo entendáis. Tiene un ADN positivo. Si nosotros duplicamos un anuncio que ha funcionado mal, ese ADN negativo también se va a duplicar y seguramente te va a llamar, ¿vale? Entonces, duplicar siempre lo que ya funciona e ir aplicando pequeños cambios para, aplicar, para alargar la vida útil de, de los anuncios. ¿Vale? Aquí os explico un poquito cómo funciona, ¿vale? Incrementar el gasto publicitario sin perder rentabilidad, ¿vale? Duplicamos las campañas o conjunto de anuncios aplicando microvariaciones, ¿vale? Que se llama. Solo un... un un euro, dos euros en el presupuesto, eh, en la edad de vuestra audiencia, la, la incrementamos en uno o bajamos un año. Cositas así, ¿vale? Que Facebook no detecte que es el mismo anuncio, porque si detecta que es exactamente el mismo, no va a funcionar, ¿vale? Necesitamos micro variaciones. Y bueno, ya está, esos son mis tres truquitos.
I mean, who of you did not properly understand Spanish? Okay, I'm gonna summarize after the last content part. And also, if you, any one of you has some super urgent question for Juan, o lo podemos hacer después, vale? Because there is still one amazing guest note speaker here, talking about Amazon, and I would really, really also like, well, invite you to stay a little bit longer with us and ask Juan all the individual questions because the three parts of content he has presented, like it's really, the, that's the real shit that makes the difference between a campaign that works and does not work. Applying just a small lookalike audience and the audience uh, expires too fast, if you burn the audience too fast, therefore, especially in a local market with GMs here, he adds the lookalike audience, makes a super lookalike audience to have some proper reach, very good. Second, dynamic uh, content optimization. Instead of doing 100 different uh, variations, only two, and two images of three, and then two, three different tags, and two different things, very good. It's like the cuatro pinceladas que marcan la diferencia. And the third one, horizontal scaling versus like vertical scaling is, a, is an endless discussion that we can happily have uh, in the networking part. So, muchísimas gracias, Juan. Now, to finish off, uh, to be honest, my favorite masterclass so far, like it's where I learned the most, because I was not just talking, as I said, um, but I learned actually a lot from Andrea, from Hugo, from Juan, and now from Thomas, we're gonna learn one very important channel, which I think in the e-commerce world, everyone should know that there is, there is no e-commerce company in 2020 that, should, that does not need an Amazon strategy. I'm not saying that every company should sell on Amazon, but at least you have to have a strategy. If you sell on your Shopify page, you have to have a strategy. How are you gonna work with competitors that sell similar products on Amazon? You have to have this channel in mind. So give a warm applause to Tomas, and thank you for being here. Thank you guys. Thank you, Patrick, for inviting me today. So yes, yeah, so a little quick step aside to talk about Amazon today. Um, there is a lot that I could talk about, but it will probably take the whole night. So I'm only gonna focus on a few points in the next 10 minutes, and after we'll be done. Uh, but before I start, let me ask you, um, who here have, um, have a Prime account? Okay. Who is regularly buying on Amazon with or without a Prime account? Okay. And who is um, selling on Amazon today? <laughs> All right. That's good, interesting. Okay, so um, my name is Thomas. I'll tell you a bit more uh, about me after, but I wanted to um, start with, with this. As you can see here, this doesn't necessarily look like uh, what you see on Amazon, but this is an Amazon store. It's a brand store that you can do on Amazon. As you know, Amazon is not necessarily the first place that brands know, that brands would think about going when they want to tell their stories or show their product features or their kind of storytelling, but it is actually a place, a marketplace, where for the past few years has introduced a lot more tools to really uh, differentiate yourself from you know, low-cost products or Chinese sellers. There is increasingly more. Obviously also Amazon, we know that it's a product, mainly a product-based search marketplace. People go on Amazon, they search for products, they don't necessarily search for brands. But with those tools, if you have an established brand, if you are, um, you know, you have, you may be a little bit pressed on top of your market, but you have great storytelling, Amazon can still become a, um, a place where people, by starting to search for product category or within your product category, might discover your brand. So it's generally a, a marketplace at the bottom of the funnel, but it can sometimes actually uh, create bring new customers on top of the funnel in brand awareness. And we know today that Amazon is almost like a third layer. You have your um, retail stores, you have your e-commerce store, and Amazon has almost become like a third layer where customers can jump around between retail, uh, e-commerce, and, and the Amazon marketplace. This is other examples of, uh, of places where you can actually tell your story or show more creatively your brand features. So for example, this is um, actually at the bottom of a product listings. You can really create uh, and uh, publish infographics, other lifestyle images. You can really put your own copy, so you can really um, convey messages uh, about your brand and about your product um, uh, throughout your, uh, your product pages. Here, actually, it's also a little video. Um, 
as time as well. If you come to me after, I can send you a bunch of examples um, to, to tell you where you can uh, actually show you all your product. Because that should also be good. Um, now, quickly about um, advertising. Um, Amazon now has become the third biggest advertiser um, digitally um, after Google and Facebook, and it's growing and it's here to stay. Increasingly, if you're a CMO, if you're a marketing manager, um, Amazon has clearly become part of the marketing mix, where if you want to really cover all of the places where you can um, make your product discoverable, uh, Amazon is part of it. Um, it's growing. It's not necessarily going to taking shares of, of, of spending from Google or, or Facebook. Sometimes, actually, uh, managers are actually putting new money on, on Amazon. Um, uh, more on Amazon advertising here. These are the classic two um, placements that you can pick from Amazon. Okay? I'm not going to go into detail here today, but you have your sponsored brand here. So you can put your logo, a little copy, and then your products. And you have your kind of sponsored product placement, which kind of work like Google on top of Switch. But there's one thing I wanted to show you today that I think is very powerful, that's been introduced maybe about a year ago and has worked for many sellers, is um, the placement. So here you have your um, kind of traditional, classic product listings in Amazon. You know, you have your photos, your titles, your bullet points. And below, if you click, if you kind of keep scrolling down, so this is the bottom of the listing we saw, you have here some products here, okay? These are sponsored products. And actually, especially these ones, are products that have been targeted specifically this specific product. So today on Amazon, you can actually tell Amazon to show your product next to underneath your competitor's product. And that's actually very, very powerful. In, in, it hasn't been completely launched in Europe, but you can also, in the US, you can also target um, products that are maybe have a lower score than you, or they may be uh, more expensive than you, or cheaper than you, up to you. But even just in Europe, uh, the um, sponsored product related or targeting a specific asset, so I'm not even talking about the brand, but you can actually pick you look at the actual reference of your competitors and you put it into your targeting and it will, it will target it. And that's something that's super powerful that I wanted to share with you today because it can be, um, it can be quite helpful to, uh, to even launch a new product. Um, last thing I wanted to talk to you guys about today is uh, how you can leverage Amazon uh, to reach international markets. And like actually very complementary to um, also Facebook advertising. Um, Amazon is growing, we all know. I'm not going to go into detail of showing you crazy numbers that don't really mean anything anymore. But, um, you know, Amazon.com in the US, you don't need a, a company to sell in the US. All you need is a credit card. It's actually easier for overseas brands to sell on Amazon US than it is for Americans. It's still pretty easy for Americans, but in the, in, if you're from Europe, you only need a credit card, you set up an Amazon account. And thanks to uh, Amazon fulfillment by Amazon, which is the logistics service. You can actually benefit from all of the logistics and customer service by sending your product to an Amazon warehouse in the US. Um, they will take care of everything, logistics, and they are the best in logistics, as we know. Customer service, you can target, customer, you can target new customers on Facebook and, and sell it on Amazon. And sell your product on Amazon. So that's something very powerful. Um, Japan as well. Um, if you think you have a product that could be um, that could be uh, of interest to a Japanese consumer, it's actually pretty easy to sell to um, Japan via Amazon Japan. You don't really have to go crazy at any strategic stuff. You have services today that can help you do that straight with Amazon. And also in Europe, I don't know if you know, but for the past few days now, um, they've actually started. It hasn't really been rolled out completely, but they've opened a new Amazon Netherlands marketplace. So you had five. We have six. Uh, so very powerful stuff. Um, Amazon Australia as well um, has been um, has been growing. So it's something that I think combined with you know a quality Facebook uh, prospecting uh, outreach could be um, could be quite helpful. Um, thank you guys. Uh, my name is Thomas. Uh, we I can help you if you guys want to just grab coffee or um, I can, you know, I usually give a 30 minutes audit for free 
So does it take to contact me if you even have a, if you're not sure if you want to go to Amazon, if you would like to cross it off, I can help you with auditing your, your, your product or your brand. I can help you launch it if you want it, and I can also take care of your account. Thank you, guys.